fire damages of Fraternity House at Ohio University this morning. Ohio University backs off on the plan to buy a $1.2 million home for the school's president. And in sports, OU track and field member Kristen Winkle is training to qualify for nationals. Newswatch at noon starts now. A fire occurred this morning in a fraternity house at Ohio University. Good afternoon, I'm Ann Campolongo. And I'm Asia Tolliver. Smoke rolled from the Phi Kappa Psi fraternity house on North College Street. Members of the fraternity were awakened just before 4 this morning. The fire started in the kitchen after a deep fryer caught flames and it traveled up the wall of 8 North College, but was quickly contained by the Athens Fire Department. There was minimal damage to the house and residents were able to get back into the house just after 4 this morning to collect belongings. 30 members have been tempor temporarily displaced, excuse me, but were expected to get back into the house later this morning. Stewart's Opera House in Nelsonville is planning to reopen this Saturday after being damaged from the fire this weekend. While the Opera House itself did not see any fire or flame damage, the theater and the office space is left with water and smoke damage. The fire occurred Saturday night and destroyed two buildings next to the Opera House, the Hawking College Art Gallery and the Hawking College Valley Museum of Theatrical History. The cause of the fire has not been determined. Tim Peacock, the executive director of Stewart's Opera House, thanks the fire department for arriving to the scene so quickly. I thought there's no way they're going to get this fire under control before it burns down the Opera House and our neighbors on the other side, the Majestic Galleries. I thought there's no way that they would contain it. Um, and they did an amazing job. A show scheduled at the Opera House for this past Sunday was canceled, but a performance by jazz singer Madeline Purex will happen this Saturday. A fire in New Boston has been ruled arson and has landed a man in jail. Marshawn Smith has been charged with setting fire to an apartment and house last Friday night, injuring two children and displacing several others. Smith's bond has been set at $1 million after being charged yesterday morning on two counts of arson and one count of criminal trespassing. Smith is expected to be in court again on Thursday. An Ohio University official says the school will not buy a $1.2 million home for the president, but he still will live there. The decision to lease the off-campus house for President McDavis and his wife with an option to purchase angered the community, who complained it was a waste of money. Steve Golding, OU's Vice President for Finance and Administration, said yesterday he will not recommend the purchase after finding out that its owner, John Wharton, had indicated he would donate to the athletic department. Golding says those ne negotiating the deal were unaware of the offer. And so to avoid the appearance of a conflict of interest, OU will not buy the house. The on-campus house, currently infested by bats, has housed university presidents since, since 1952 and could remain the president's residence. Initial assessment of 29 Park Place has begun and we anticipate it will be completed this calendar year. All of this back and forth will not affect the McDavises anytime soon. The lease on 31 Coventry Lane lasts until June 30th, 2017. The Ohio University Women's Center along with the LGBT Center are hosting their annual Take Back the Night Week. Last night, the organization hosted a panel discussing personal violence such as bullying and domestic violence. Newswatch at Noon reporter Lauren Lippert was at the event and tells us why such public events are important in raising awareness of the problem. Sexual assaults are never an easy topic to talk about. Assaults that happen in the LGBT community are often not talked about at all. Take Back the Night Week aims to fix the problem that many don't talk about. Madison Koenig is a Student Senate Women's Affairs Commissioner. Take Back the Night is a week of events that um, sort of look at different aspects of sexual violence and gender-based violence. Um, so we have created a bunch of different events that will happen during the week that hopefully touch on um, different communities' needs. Ohio University has participated in Take Back the Night Week for over 30 years. And even though time brings change, the goal to educate people on sexual violence has stayed the same. So the LGBT Center is one of the sponsors for Take Back the Night Week, including Take Back the Night panel. And they're located here on the third floor of Baker. F Rape Culture is a social movement that challenges the rape culture on campus. The co-founder of the organization, Claire Cambridge, helped organize the panel for the discussion of violence. She says she hopes the panel will shed light on the pressing issues that most don't normally talk about. With the panel tonight, I'm really hoping to just spread awareness. Um, intimate partner violence within the LGBT community is something that is oftentimes swept under the rug or not taken seriously for a variety of reasons. 
for Newswatch at noon. I'm Lauren Lippert. Take Back the Night events continue throughout the week. Each day's schedule is on the Women's Center website at ohio.edu slash women's center. Those looking to put on special events in Athens streets may have to face a new city permitting system. The new application process would expedite Athens City Council's six-week system for approving special events and would allow quicker assessments for such occasions. The new system would require event organizers to go through a checklist of requirements, which will include health and safety issues, sanitation, sound levels, vending, and insurance. Ohio State's Education Board has approved a policy change that opponents say could potentially get rid of elementary school music, art, nursing, and counseling offerings statewide. The Ohio Board of Education voted 11 to 7 on Monday to eliminate the so-called 5 of 8 rule, which set the minimum number of art, music, and physical education teachers, counselors, librarians, nurses, social workers, and visiting teachers. The decades-old rule required at least five of those positions for every thousand students in a school district. Most Ohio University students are finding out that the true price of education is debt. Newswatch at Noon reporter Clay Benjamin joins us live from College Green with how Ohio University's campus newspaper, The Post, is shining a light on this growing problem. Clay, what can you tell us about this series? The Post's five-part series is called The Degree of Debt, which explores student debt at Ohio University and how students are affected by it. Another day, another dollar for Ohio University students, literally. According to the Ohio University website, for an in-state student that will be living in the dorms, it costs almost $24,000 to attend Ohio University, and almost $33,000 for students who come from out of state. It's a huge burden, really, um, as a you know, middle class student from a middle class family. It's hard to find the actual money, tangible money, without using loans to pay for college. One way students are trying to avoid student loans is to work minimum wage. According to the Post, a student from Ohio would have to work 35 full-time weeks at minimum wage to pay for a full year of school in 2015, and that is excluding taxes. The cost of a four-year degree at OU has increased almost $7,000 since 1978 after adjusting for inflation. In comparison, Miami University increased its tuition by almost $12,000 since 1980. As of right now, students are left to just sit and twiddle their thumbs with the knowledge that debt is soon to come. According to the Post, the cost of OU tuition will increase by 2% for the 2015-2016 academic school year. Live from College Green, I'm Clay Benjamin. Thanks, Clay. We now have Alan Smith with us live. Alan is the project editor for The Post, um, and he was one of the people behind the Degree of Debt us. series. Alan, Wait. thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Asia. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So was the problem as bad as you expected when the story was assigned? Actually, yes. Uh, Ohio University, as recently as 2011, had the second highest rate of defaults on student loans. Now, since the Board of Trustees has said that that rate has decreased uh, in the years following, but still uh, far too high. and uh, in-state tuition for Ohio University is higher uh, than the average in-state tuition for uh, schools across the nation. Uh, actually, for Ohio, it's a little bit lower than in-state tuition for most four-year public universities. Uh, but we expect that this problem to affect many, many students on campus. All right, absolutely. Um, what does the university have to say about all of this? Well, the university understands that this is a huge problem. They are confident in their Ohio guarantee to help solve some of it, although they understand that the Ohio guarantee is not so much a plan for student affordability as it is for planning, uh, planning for parents and students when they go to college so they know how much they'll have to pay for four years. Now there is a 5.1% increase that's going to come in uh, at once, so obviously that's been a reason for protests that have happened on campus all throughout the year involving uh, tuition, up, uh, tuition increases, but the university is still steadfast in defending the Ohio guarantee and they've also said that uh, they've increased financial aid as tuition's gone up to help uh, decrease that burden of tuition. Okay, and what's next for The Post? What's the next project? So Assistant Culture Editor Rebecca Barnes will have a piece on Thursday. It's our uh, year-long postmodern series. There's a feature from Culture Staff every week. It's actually taking a look at uh, single-use bathrooms, uh, bathroom accessibility, and how many bathrooms are inclusive to all groups uh, on campus, uh, gender-neutral bathrooms. So it's a piece I'm excited to, uh, excited to see. You can catch it online Wednesday night or in the paper Thursday morning. All right. Thank you so much, Alan. All right. Alan Thank Smith, you, the project director of The Post, thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me on. 
Bricks fell nine stories off the side of a building in downtown Cleveland. And Jody Arias has been formally sentenced by a judge to life in prison. These stories and more when Newswatch at Noon returns. Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. For those dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers to help us better care for ourselves and the ones we love. A judge has formally sentenced convicted murderer Jody Ar Arias to life in prison, ending a nearly seven-year-old case that attracted worldwide attention. Arias killed her boyfriend, Travis Alexander, in 2008 after a stormy relationship. The decision by Judge Sh Sherry Stevens was largely a formality after a jury deadlocked last month on whether to give Arias the death penalty or life in prison. The mistrial removed the death penalty as an option. She's shown remorse since the day I met her. Um, the relationship was toxic. It doesn't mean that Mr. Alexander deserved it. And I think that, that everybody should know that, that the defense has never said that. What happened to him is horrible. I think that a possibility of release would have been reasonable for the judge to give. The judge said she saw no reason for leniency. The man wanted in the shooting death of Ron Lane, the print shop director at a community college in North Carolina, has been arrested. Goldsboro Police Captain Dwayne Dean says 20-year-old Kenneth Morgan Stancil III was arrested earlier today where he was found sleeping on a Daytona beach, a violation of local ordinance. Dean says officials will work to have Stancil return to North Carolina to face charges. Officials from the Ohio Agricultural Department have euthanized the lion they removed from an animal sanctuary. The state agriculture department said Leo the lion's health had been failing for a while. Recently, he was having a hard time moving and was not eating. In addition to removing Leo, six tigers and four other exotic animals were also removed. Officials say the owner ignored warnings that he needed a permit to keep them. The owner of the animal sanctuary is fighting in court to get the animals back. The mother of the two-year-old boy who fell into a cheetah exhibit at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo on Saturday has been charged. Michelle Schwab of Delaware was charged with child endangering after she held the boy over a protective railing. According to the reports, the child fell breaking his left leg. The Cleveland Zoo closed the cheetah exhibit after Saturday's incident. The exhibit is set to reopen Monday. However, the pavilion where the incident occurred will remain closed. Some Ohio police are protesting plans to close several small training facilities. Those changes will come as police training will be getting a facelift with a one-size-fits-all one size approach, according to Jack, Jack Hershey, head of the State Community College Association. Hershey questions whether this is the best approach to serve all Ohio communities. Cleveland officials are trying to determine what caused the bricks to fall nine stories from the side of the former National City Bank building in downtown Cleveland onto the street just before rush hour yesterday. The bricks crushed a parked minivan, but no injuries were reported. The area is being cleaned up, but, the remain, uh, but remains closed while the incident is investigated and the remaining bricks are secured. Another motion picture is set to be filmed in the Cincinnati area this spring. 
The Greater Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky Film Commission said yesterday that the filming of GOAT is scheduled to begin May 4th. Local media outlets report that GOAT is based on a memoir written by Brad Land about two brothers who pledge a fraternity and go through hazing. The Film Commission works to attract and promote the film, television, and commercial production throughout the Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky area. More rain is headed our way later this week. And OU track and field member Kristen Winkle is training to qualify for nationals. Learn about her plans for the rest of the season when Newswatch at Noon returns. I'm one on Lucky Guy. The chance of being involved in a robbery is 1 in 757. The chances of being struck by lightning is 1 in 750,000. Please fasten your seatbelts for unexpected turbulence. The chances of being a victim in an airline crash, 1 in 29 million. Hey, could I get some peanuts? The chances of being involved in a car crash are far greater than lightning strikes and plane crashes. And if you are texting while driving, your risk of crash increases 23 times. Now, I may be an unlucky guy, but I don't have to be part of that statistic, and neither do you. Drive responsibly. You make me wear my bike helmet. You taught me never to run with scissors. And to follow the swimming rules. You tell me to stay away from drugs. To always buckle my seatbelt. So why do you keep a loaded gun in your drawer? How safe is that? You ask them to follow some safety rules, now they're asking you. In fact, they're counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. Remember, always lock it up. Visit ncpc.org. Mm -hmm. Homemade noodles. Oh. Marty, stop it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It reminds me, I've been thinking uh, maybe we should try a new form of birth control. I heard about this one, it's called the IUD, intrauterine device. Or we could try the patch on your arm. Actually, I think that one goes on your butt. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more, and it's... What do you think, though? Arm or the butt? A grandmother was rescued this morning. Lane Nielsen rescued the grandmother using a raft after severe storms caused homes and much of Mobile Country and Alabama to flood. Neighbors and witnesses say this is the worst flooding the town has seen. The city at one point faced flood waters as high as nearly six feet. You know, speaking of flooding, I know last week flooding got pretty bad here in Athens. It did, definitely. Josh Gregory is in the Weather Center to fill us in on what to expect today and throughout the week. Josh, can we expect more rain this week or even flooding? Well, Ann, rain will be coming our way later on this week. However, it will not get as bad as it was last week, and we won't have to see a chance of flooding. Uh, looking at today, 60 degrees is our temperature right now. Um, you'll see mostly cloudy skies. You may see that sun peak in um, a few times throughout the day, but for the most part, the sky will be gray and cloudy. Um, a little breezy, too. We've got 10 mile per hour winds coming from the northwest area, so feeling a little cooler, and that 61% humidity will only add to that. Um, looking around the area, you'll see that like temperatures are all around in the upper 50s or getting into the 60s and here in Athens 60. Down Ripley we've got 61, we've got 58 up in Columbus and Cambridge and that will just continue to increase throughout the day. Looking at our almanac you'll see that it shows we're right around the average 67 degrees as our high that's just three degrees above the normal high and 42 degrees as our lowest just three degrees above the normal uh, low. Um, Luckily, in 2006, we don't have to deal with temperatures this warm. 82 degrees feels a little too hot in this April weather and definitely too cool. 16 degrees, that's definitely not spring temperatures back in 1989. Also, keep in mind that the days will continue to get longer. Sunrise is 6.53 a.m. and you'll be able to catch the sunset at uh, excuse me, 8.04 p.m. Probably not tonight or throughout the week because the, it'll be pretty cloudy and, and there will be rain. Um, and here's the culprit for the rain. You'll see that there's a low pressure system coming under a high pressure system. You can see right here below Indiana and in Tennessee that there is um, 
a big storm setting um, caused by the two fronts colliding. Um, and we'll be getting some of that storm here in our southeastern area and in West Virginia. So make sure when we might see some of this rain Wednesday evening, definitely on Thursday and Friday. So keep an umbrella with you. Um, luckily, that high pressure system will push the rain to the south and out of our way over the weekend. Now, as I said, Six, uh, the temperatures will increase. We're in mid 60s all around. We've got 65 in Columbus and Chillicothe and New Lexington, 67 in Athens and Ripley, and we'll get to 65 down in Ironton. These uh, temperatures will continue to drop. 43 in Chillicothe, 42 is your low in Athens, 42 is also low in Columbus. Um, so our overnight, 42 degrees. Um, clouds, you see, um, it'll, it'll start to clear up tonight, um, partly cloudy. There won't be any chance of rain. It still will be a little breezy, so if you're out and about tonight, make sure to dress appropriately. Maybe bring out that jacket because it might be available. Um, now, um, plan your night accordingly as well. 58 degrees at 8 p.m. Um, the, there'll be um, overcast, 52 degrees, um, it'll just get down to cooler in um, midnight and the clouds will start to clear up and 47 at 6 a.m. And looking throughout the week, make sure that um, you dress appropriately for the rain that's coming through on Thursday and Friday. Um, temperature is still consistent, we may peak up in uh, the 70s Friday and uh, Saturday we'll see the, um, the rain uh, start to clear up but that'll come back Sunday and it will continue into Monday. You know, April showers do bring May flowers, so I'm kind of excited to see what that looks like here in the coming weeks. Right, thank you so much, Josh. It's International Week at Ohio University. Multiple activities are planned around the theme, Our Global Family Celebration. And it's Take Back the Night Week. Take a look at some events happening this week in today's community calendar. Corbin Bagford here with us to fill us in on sports. And Corbin, I know the Masters just finished up on Sunday, but the Ohio golf team is in a tournament. How are they doing? Well, they're doing pretty well, and Jordan Spieth may not play golf for Ohio, but we have some guys certainly stay in their case. The Ohio golf team is wrapping up play at the Greenbrier Invitational today. The team is tied for fifth place, entering the final round. Ty Harrod's even par score currently leads the Bobcats and has him tied for sixth place through two rounds. Another Ohio sophomore, Peyton White, is tied for ninth place, sitting at one over par. Winkle is continuing to improve into the Mid-American Conference Championships. Now she has the potential to qualify for nationals. Newswatch at Noon reporter Taylor Alexander spoke to Winkle about her plans for the rest of the season and working through her injury. With the Mid-American Conference Championships a month away, the women on the Ohio University track and field team are focused on qualifying for the meet. One athlete who has already qualified is sprinter Kristen Winkle, and the junior has high goals as the season nears an end. For the rest of the season, I hope to place first at max or at least get top three, and I'm sitting at fourth, so I'm right there as long as I have a good day. And to get under 14 seconds is the major goal, and that'll definitely put me in a good position for a second round of NCAAs. Kristen normally competes in about four events per meet, but her best event is the hurdles. She hopes to hit a new personal record by the end of the season. After I crossed the finish line when I ran my PR, I never thought I could ever run that time. So it's just getting, it's going down more and more every week. So that's a good sign and it's just, it's unbelievable to me. Dealing with adhesions in her shin, Winkle refuses to let that hold her back as she stays true to her motto for the season. Um, just be fearless. You can't be afraid. Um, I'm a junior, so I still have another year. What's the worst that could happen? I sit out if I get hurt, so just be fearless when you run. And the women's track and field coach Clay Calkins agrees that she is indeed running without fear. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure she's striving for you know not only uh, you know to uh, to solidify a position in the top 48 in the East Region, but uh, also for you know that school record. So it's uh, uh, you know you're in the 1370s, uh, uh, banging it out to get the school record. Then you're you're going to the uh, you know typically going to the NCAA first round. With the times Winkle has been running, she has the potential to qualify for nationals. For Newswatch at noon, I'm Taylor Alexander. Thanks, Taylor. In order to qualify for nationals, an athlete must be top 48 in their region. The list does not conclude until the third week of May. Winkle currently sits in 98th with a time of 14.11 seconds. The Ohio softball team will hope to bounce back from two weekend losses when they host Dayton for a doubleheader this afternoon. The Bobcats were swept by Kent State in a two-game series this weekend and won't have it any easier when facing the Flyers today. Dayton tops the Atlantic 10 Conference with a record of 28-11 and 12-2 in conference play. The Flyers have won nine of their last ten games. Today's doubleheader begins at four, immediately followed by the second game. And on another diamond three and a half hours north of Athens, the Ohio baseball team will take on Youngstown State. The Penguins won the Horizon League title last season, but haven't fared so well this year. Youngstown State enters the showdown with a record of 9-20 and, and a 4-11 record in Horizon League play. Ohio dropped two of three to Bowling Green this past weekend, but has won five of its last seven games. With these, when these two last met in 2013, the Penguins came out on top 20 to 15. And no, that's not a mistake. That's a baseball score. It's 20 to 15. If today's score comes close to that, we'll all be surprised. First pitch is set for 5:30 this evening. And we have a full slate of high school baseball action as well this afternoon. Athens will play host to non-conference opponent Marietta. The Alexander Spartans will square off with New Lexington of the Muskingum Valley League. In TVC Ohio play, Nelsonville York is traveling to Vinton County to make up a game that was postponed earlier this season. And in the TVC Hawking, another makeup game, the Trimble Tomcats will host Miller. And on the big league diamond, the Cincinnati Reds have only played seven games so far, but three have gone to extra innings. The Reds series opener against the Cubs went 10 innings last night. The Reds roughed up Chicago starter John Lester, but their lead was surrendered when Jorge Soler crushed his second home run of the night to level the score. After Reds reliever Manny Parra loaded the bases with no outs in the bottom of the 10th, Cubs second baseman Eris Mendy Alcantara sent the fans at Wrigley Field home happy with a walk-off RBI single. The loss is Cincinnati's third straight after beginning the season 4-0. And the Cleveland Cavaliers rested their starters in a loss to the Celtics on Sunday, and the rest seemed to pay off. The Cavs picked up right where they left, and left off in a 109-97 victory over Detroit last night. LeBron James got things started with this slick feed to Timothy Mozgov. That slam was part of a commanding first quarter that had the Cavs up 36-14 after one. The Pistons cut into the deficit, but the gap was never less than 11 in the second half. LeBron finished with a triple-double of 21 points, 11 assists, and 10 rebounds. J.R. Smith paced the Cavs with 28 points. That included eight three-pointers. Andre Drummond led the Pistons with 20 points and nine boards. And the Columbus Blue Jackets season may be over, but players are already looking forward to next season. Many veterans on the roster said that the team needs to name a captain. The Blue Jackets have been without a captain since 2012 and are one of only three teams in the NHL without a player donning the C on his chest. Columbus is one of just six teams in NHL history to go captainless for three straight seasons. And guys, Rick Nash was the Blue Jackets' last captain back in 2012 before he got traded to the Rangers, so it should be interesting if they do decide to name a captain who it's going to be. Definitely interesting. Thank you, Corbin. Mm -hmm. With the weather warming up, who doesn't love an ice cream cone? Today, Ben & Jerry's wants you to enjoy a free, a free one. The company is offering free cones to anyone who drops by one of their scoop shops. The annual Free Cone Day is a way to celebrate and thank fans for their support. You can find your nearest scoop shop by visiting benjerry.com. That does it for our broadcast this afternoon, but be sure to tune in to Newswatch tonight at 6.30 for updates on your local and state news. And tomorrow on Newswatch at noon, we'll tell you about a plan to monitor groundwater from injection wells. For Ann Campolongo, Josh Gregory, and Corbin Bradford, I'm Asia Talbert. Thanks for watching.